uh, next speaker, Rama's from the International Center for Theoretical Sciences in Bengaluru. And uh, at a personal level, I first met Rama when I was part of a JFM road trip in 2017 and had the pleasure of, of sitting next to her at dinner and hearing about actually some very interesting ideas she had about formation and size of raindrops, which uh, remains an open problem. Uh, but she's better known and has won awards for her work on instabilities in shear flows, in uh, turbulent entrainment and uh, hydraulic jumps. Uh, she's going to talk to us today about stratified viscosity uh, and then a, a, an intriguing subtitle of a singular and nonlinear tale. So I look forward to that, Rama, and over to you. Uh, thank you, Gray. Uh, so uh, this talk, unlike the previous one, is going to be about uh, high Reynolds number flow. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about a stratified viscosity, and I'm going to try and convince you that it has singular effects, namely big effects for even small viscosity changes, and also going to convince you that although it's the viscous term, it has a very high uh, impact on the nonlinear behavior and it brings new non-linearities to bear on the problem. So um, though I've never had the uh, you know, fortune of knowing George Batchelor personally, I have heard a lot about him, especially from Rodam Narsima and also Mike Gaster, and they've always spoken in glowing terms of him. So I know him since my student days, know of him since my student days, and I uh, try to fancy myself doing fluid mechanics in the kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, pattern that, um, uh, that uh, George Batchelor has given to us. So uh, here is viscosity stratification. I've given a few examples of viscosity stratified flows. So uh, these are only a few examples. Viscosity stratification is ubiquitous. Like once you start thinking about it, you'll realize that any flow where the temperature is a function of space and time, the concentration of two fluids is a function of space and time. Viscosity can even be a function of pressure when pressure is very high or it could be a function of shear rate in non-Newtonian uh, fluids. It can be a function of what particulates that the fluid has. So uh, almost everywhere around you, you'll see viscosity stratified flows. And apart from these examples of which my favorite is chocolate, which I'd like to study. Um, I'd like to also say that in this talk, we're going to talk about molecular viscosity, but also important is eddy viscosity and its stratification. So here is an example in the Bay of Bengal, probably the first measurements of turbulence that we were lucky to get. Uh, you will see that um, uh, there's a two decade, two order of magnitude uh, drop in the eddy diffusivity during the monsoon months. So, uh, and uh, uh, it's basically two order of, uh, two orders of magnitude difference between a 22 meter below the surface and 65 meters below the surface. So you will see that uh, this is a huge stratification of eddy viscosity and the methods to deal with such uh, stratification has not even been developed. Okay, so now uh, what are the equations that we're going to be talking about today? So we have the Navier-Stokes equations, except that viscosity comes inside the grad term because it's a function of space and time. And then there's continuity because it's incompressible. And uh, the temperature equation, uh, which actually feeds back into the momentum equation through the viscosity, which is a function of temperature. Here, temperature is just a placeholder for, it could be concentration, it could be a variety of other things. We might have to replace this by other equations. So these are the equations we're going to study. And now in high Reynolds number, it's normal to imagine, and you know, the, one of the standard things you do under the Boussinesq approximation, which is not usually mentioned, but it's taken for granted, is that you take viscosity to be a constant, even though temperature and concentration and so on are changing. So like the uh, argument you may like to give for this is that, uh, uh, you know, continuous viscosity variations might just change the answer numerically, but there's going to be no fundamental change in the uh, answer. So like you need not consider viscosity stratification. The goal of this lecture is to give a resounding no. 
Okay. We want to answer this question with a no. So let's start with what happens in unstratified flow. So in unstratified flow, uh, you have this standard, uh, you know, um, uh, things which change with the Reynolds number. So here is Reynolds number increasing and Reynolds numbers here defined by some length scale, like the half width of the shear flow. We're considering shear flows which are predominantly in one direction and they vary in the other direction. So uh, in this uh, coordinate frame X, Y, and Z, uh, U is in the X direction and it's a function of Y. And now uh, it's uh, well known that, you know, below a certain Reynolds number RE energy, uh, you have monotonic uh, decay of all perturbations that you may put into the flow. And above another Reynolds number RE critical, you have exponential growth of at least one perturbation. So you can, the lamina flow goes unstable by the standard route. And in between REE and RE critical, you have algebraic growth. So because of the non-normal nature of the uh, linear uh, system, the linear instability system of the Navier-Stokes uh, in a shear flow, you have algebraic growth of perturbations. And then it, those algebraic perturbations would die out if the flow were, uh, if the whole system was linear, but if they uh, develop to big amplitudes, then the whole system can go non-linear. And one big important question is how does the flow go to turbulence and at which Reynolds number does it go to turbulence in a given flow? So this is a big question in unstratified flows. And when I say stratification, I mean viscosity. We're not talking density here. Density is a constant for this talk. So the exponential growth and the algebraic growth, the, the primary, uh, uh, the most dominant growing modes differ in the following way. So in one case, they're spanwise independent as was shown by earlier theorems. And in another case, they're actually streamwise independent. So they're actually uh, these structures that you see, the disturbance structures are actually perpendicular to each other. Now, what happens with viscosity stratification? We talked about the standard dogma over here. Um, with viscosity stratified flow, it's going to be, and this slide is going to tell most of what I'm going to speak about today. Um, this, uh, in viscosity stratified flow, you're going to get um, this critical Reynolds number changing dramatically. So it could go all the way down, very, very far down. And, you know, the algebraic growth can become extremely unimportant in a small window. And you could have exponential growths of instability in a huge part of the Reynolds number uh, regime. And this can go very, very low in Reynolds. So uh, this is because viscosity stratification can act as a singular perturbation. And we will come to what that is. So then, um, the other thing that can happen uh, in this same uh, singular perturbation regime is that you could get a very uh, low Reynolds number instability of a different kind. And here one example is an O instability, which uh, I'm calling for overlap instability. And we will talk about what the overlap mode of instability is. And then uh, it's a mode that we proposed some years ago. And then there can be a, a normal algebraic growth regime in the Reynolds number and followed by a second exponential growth regime. So this kind of thing can also happen when viscosity stratified uh, flow, in viscosity stratified flow, where the stratification acts as a singular perturbation. So now this is usually typical of two fluid flow where there's fluid of viscosity one and viscosity two being fed in like this, and you have a thin mixed layer in between. And this is, um, but this is not uh, only in such flows, it can even happen in gentle stratification under certain conditions. But we're going to separate, you know, uh, these thin mixed layer flows uh, just for the sake of argument uh, from uh, flows where the viscosity is more gently stratified, such as here's a channel where the temperature is a linear function of space in the laminar situation. So in these two situations, you're going to get entirely different behavior. And here you're focusing on the algebraic growth. And we're going to ask, does viscosity stratified flow do something entirely different from unstratified flow? 
and we are going to show that it is nonlinear from the word go. There's going to be a very important role for nonlinearity from the word go, uh, as opposed to um, the standard case where uh, nonlinearities, you know, creep in at a later time. So we're going to see, and then the fun there's going to be other fundamental differences. So let's go to the overlap instability or a low Reynolds number instability. And uh, using this as an example, we'll ask what is singular perturbation and where does it come into our game? So here I've just written a standard ordinary differential equation of second order. And uh, the, the second derivative term, the highest derivative term is multiplied by a very, very small number epsilon. So like you might imagine that because epsilon is very, very, very small, we can throw it away and solve the problem with just these two terms. And you would be right in most of the regime, except remember this, you've now dropped the second derivative, so you can't satisfy both boundary conditions. So at near one boundary, you're going to be extremely wrong. And that's what uh, this uh, singular perturbation thing is about. In the boundary where you're extremely wrong, you're going to have um, a dominant balance where this term is going to become extremely important and you'll have to derive a different equation which is going to be correct for that part of the domain. So these are effectively singular perturbation problems. And George Batchelor in the first JFM volume in 1956 said this, when the Reynolds number of the motion is large, viscous forces according to our premise are small everywhere except in the neighborhood of certain singular surfaces. So he realized that in these certain singular surfaces, viscosity appears in the dominant balance. So that's what we're going to talk about. And now like we're going to bring in a new twist where there is viscosity stratification. So viscosity is coming inside the grad variable, grad operator. So now suppose we took the Navier-Stokes, we linearized it in the usual manner you do for or Sommerfeld or and then you put the perturbation in Fourier transform in the X and Z directions. In this case, for shorthand, I've written X. And uh, you had a phase speed C. So then, like, you put this perturbation and plug it back into this. And you ask, in which regions uh, is viscosity going to be important? Remember that this term is a second derivative term, which is exactly like that term. So, like, where you have, uh, you know, uh, grad uh, square u that's going to be important in some regions and the grad mu grad u type terms are also going to be equally important in some regions. So then uh, for the unstratified flow the dominant balance was written down by C.C. Lin in 1944 and uh, he showed that there's a layer called a critical layer and in this layer the velocity uh, the mean flow velocity is of the same order or very close to the phase speed of the dominant disturbance. And when this, um, these two are extremely close to each other, in a little layer of thickness, Reynolds to the power minus one third. And remember that Reynolds is of order thousands. So this thing minus one third is of order 0.1. So this isn't a very, very thin layer. It's actually a reasonably thick layer in which viscosity is going to be important. And then like now suppose you have a flow with, you know, two different viscosities. And let's say this critical layer overlaps with the viscosity stratified layer. So in this critical layer, you now have a viscosity gradient. Then the dominant balance is going to be completely changed. And this we could show that once you have a small, even a small difference in viscosity, so long as you place it properly, in the channel, you're going to get this overlap mode of instability. And we're going to see what that is in a minute. But before that, we need to learn about another uh, kind of thing that viscosity stratification does. We all know the rayleigh fiotov theorems for inviscid flow, which says that if your you know, mean uh, velocity profile has an inflection point in it, that means u double prime goes to a zero, that is d, d square u by dy square, goes to a zero somewhere. And at that point, if u prime is at a maximum, then there is an instability. Now, this thing is a very, very good thumb rule for viscous flows as well. So this happens in viscous flows as well. So where you have, um, you know, if you have a profile like this, the thumb rule is it's way less stable than a profile like this. 
And when does that happen? So if you have a pressure gradient driving the viscous force as it is in the mean flow, and this is the standard, uh, you know, um, balance between pressure and the second derivative of velocity in an unstratified flow, you now have a new term. And depending on the sign of this term, you can either make this profile closer to inflectional or far away from inflectional. And the closer it goes to inflectional, you're going to get uh, more uh, instability. So then uh, in liquids, if I have a cold wall, then the viscosity is higher near the wall and I would get a profile like this. So remember, cold walls are destabilizing hot walls are stabilizing. And this kind of thing was uh, known in lubricated pipelining decades ago where they tried to put a less viscous fluid to stabilize or you know, to uh, run this flow with uh, less pressure gradient. And the opposite is true in air because air, uh, air's viscosity increases with temperature. So you want to actually to stabilize, you want to cool the wall. And this also has been studied for decades as a kind of way of stabilizing boundary layers. Now, let's go and look at the results for the overlap instability. So here we have, you know, a core annular flow of two miscible fluids, viscosity one and viscosity M. And in this case, M is 1.2. It's a little higher than one. So the viscosities differ by a modest amount. And there is a small layer of thickness delta at a distance h from the lower wall uh, and the same at the higher wall. And uh, in this region, the viscosity is stratified. So now we'll keep moving h down these things. And you'll see that when h overlaps with the critical layer, you start seeing this overlap mode of instability. And this is at a very, very low Reynolds number. So this is a neutral stability boundary where there's Reynolds number on the x-axis and um, wave number of the perturbation on the y-axis. And this green dotted line is for the standard Tolmin schlichting number of 5772 that's famous in a channel. So everywhere here, the dotted parts are unstable and the white part is stable. So you will see that there is the standard Tolmin schlichting which changes around a little bit in all cases. But then there is this overlap mode of instability at extremely low Reynolds number. And then there is this another kind of instability which comes because viscosity has made the base flow more inflectional. So this is a nice example where the overlap mode of instability, where there is an overlap between the critical layer of the dominant disturbance, the uh, phase speed of the disturbance is same as the basic flow velocity, and that is overlapping with the viscosity stratified layer. And then this is because any viscosity stratification can make the flow more inflectional. And so these two modes can merge and they can be displayed as a single mode. Now what happens is that this was all at a uh, diffusivity of infinity. So if these two fluids were, you know, magically highly diffusive in each other, and uh, so, but we know that, you know, in order to keep this miscible layer thin, we need some amount of diffusivity. And while small, uh, small uh, finite diffusivity doesn't do anything as you go poorer and poorer in diffusivity. So now when you have, let's say, uh, salt or sugar, we know that salt and sugar diffuse way, way, way slower, orders of magnitude slower than momentum. And even heat uh, diffuses seven times slower than momentum in water. So then when you introduce this fact that, uh, you know, these two, the components which are uh, causing this viscosity difference are slowly diffusing, you can get a Reynolds, uh, you can get an instability at incredibly low Reynolds number. So here's a Reynolds number of 20 where you first see the instability and you could do more singular perturbation theory just like we did to understand these things and their dominant balances. You could get a critical Schmidt number. Schmidt number is the ratio of um, uh, diffusivity of the solvent to uh, kinematic viscosity. And when it's greater than a certain number, which happens in salt, sugar, and so on, you can get an extremely low Reynolds number instability, which is over a huge uh, range of wave numbers. So this poor miscibility uh, instability can take over. Now, this is just the same thing as what I showed in the previous slide, except that in this paper, we worked with just two fluids instead of core annular flow. And we did this because, you know, it's easier to 
uh, match with experiments. So our whole idea was to see if we can, uh, you know, induce somebody to do an experiment and see what we see. And so again, you get the overlap mode of instability, this time at very low Reynolds number of order 10. And then it's a happy situation where we do the direct numerical simulations and we see this instability, we see it grow and then later it becomes nonlinear, we see it become three-dimensional and disturb the entire flow. So now this is important because normally when you look at a thin mixed layer, you would think of it as a kind of sharp interface. The behavior of this is extremely different from that of a sharp interface uh, because it becomes three-dimensional very quickly as opposed to instabilities on sharp interfaces. And so much more interesting dynamics can happen besides which it's more unstable. Now, uh, the ex recent experiments of Carbonaro and Tutsolillo in the University of M Montpellier, uh, you can see that they have got this Reynolds number of order 10. And uh, as far as they can see, the instability happens when the mixed layer overlaps with the critical layer, which is exactly the overlap mode of instability. But I've written a but here. So because the, um, uh, because the um, uh, geometry is slightly different from ours. So uh, the summary for this class of flows is given here. So here's the big picture. As the Schmidt number increases, flow goes more unstable. Reynolds increases, flow goes more unstable. As the viscosity towards the wall increases, the flow goes more unstable. So this is a very uh, simple big picture that you can have. And uh, remember that these changes are dramatic. They're not small. So up to now, we've talked about the exponential growth of disturbances. We've talked about situations where uh, you get a, um, an eigenvalue which is growing and uh, so uh, you have exponential growth in some uh, range of wave numbers or the other. But so and because of this we get at very low Reynolds number this overlap mode of instability and inflectional instability and also instability dominated by permissibility. So questions that remain for the future are like does this thing actually just show pretty patterns or does the flow go to turbulence and if it goes to turbulence under what conditions and how. So this was about the uh, singular behavior of uh, viscosity stratification. So now let's go to the other thing where we're going to talk about nonlinearities. So now we're going to talk about the algebraic growth regime which is sandwiched in Reynolds number between the place where there's monotonic decay, the Reynolds number range where everything decays and the Reynolds number where you get exponential growth. And this is very, very important in shear flows because most shear flows go to turbulence in this regime. They go to turbulence when there's no exponential growth of disturbances. And beyond a certain Reynolds number here, which is a question mark, um, there are at least two attractive states possible. So you could have a laminar state and a turbulent state. Both of them are attractive and there's a basin boundary dividing them. So both these states could be attained in a range of Reynolds numbers. So the question is what happens to all of this when you put in viscosity stratification? And we're going to talk about a heated flow, but uh, you know, our arguments are generic. We're going to talk about a channel flow where you have a hot wall and a cold wall. So this is the geometry we'll be discussing for the rest of this talk. So we're going to ask, is viscosity stratified flow more nonlinear? And answer yes. And ask, is the energy growth fundamentally different? And answer yes. So now when you do a linear stability analysis of this and you get the algebraic growth, the transient growth, and you, can, you have ways of optimizing for the transient growth and finding what is the maximum transient growth possible. So then here's a result for a particular wave number of perturbation. And there's a whole uh, range of viscosity uh, gradients here. And the da dashed line is for the unstratified case. So all of them seem merged onto each other. There's time on the x-axis and there's the energy growth on the y-axis. So if you start with an energy of one, it reaches an energy of about 25, the perturbation kinetic energy. 
So you see that stratification didn't do too much. So your first instinct would be to say, oh, uh, viscosity stratification may be important for moving the critical Reynolds number in a certain range of situations. But when it cannot move the critical Reynolds number, it does absolutely nothing. But you would be quite wrong about it because the first thing you'll notice is that the structures, you know, normally the instability structures, I told you they are, uh, now we're looking in the span and now these are stream-wise structures which are there. And typically they would be channel filling in the unstratified flow, but this symmetry is broken even for a small temperature difference as Sharad Joes found out. And now like we'll go and talk about nonlinear and see what more can change. Is there something more fundamental uh, apart from the structures just being pushed to one side of the channel? So here uh, we will talk about nonlinear, non-modal stability theory. And I will recommend the audience to read this very nice annual review paper of Rich Kurzweil. So it was realized like some time ago itself by people that, you know, if you just do linear stability, even if you're taking into account the fact that the flow is non-modal, you're going to miss a lot of the physics. You're going to miss this important question of what is the minimal seed? So like here is a laminar attractor. I told you there are Reynolds number ranges where the lamina and the turbulent state coexist. Here's a basin boundary in some very high dimensional space between the laminar attractor and the turbulent attractor. It involves, you know, the velocity at every place uh, in the channel and so on. So suppose you uh, perturb about the laminar attractor. So in our case, it's the Poise flow and we're going to perturb with energies of different, different amplitudes. You might have to go to a finite amplitude before you just touch the turbulent boundary. So for this, it's very, very important to study nonlinear, non-modal stability theory. It's important to do it non-linearly so that you're able to understand the transition to turbulence. So here's an example from Cherubini et al, where they show that when you have at short times, the linear, the most growing linear mode and the most growing linear set of perturbations and the most growing nonlinear optimal initial conditions are very similar up to, let's say, a time of 20. But if you want to understand what's happening at long time, like 150, you need to uh, do the uh, non-linear optimal, which is going to grow orders of magnitude more than the linear optimal can. The linear optimal is going to decay after a long time. All linear things are going to decay after a long time. So if you're going to look for linear optimals in this regime, you're going to be very wrong. So remember that at short times, linear is good. And the way to study this is by uh, direct adjoint looping, the technique we'll talk about in the next slide, to optimize a cost functional. So you might want to optimize, you know, the smallest distance to turbulence, or you might want to optimize a variety of things. And uh, this uh, optimization, when you go from linear to nonlinear, becomes very uh, computationally complex. And that's why the work on this is fairly recent, like about a decade old. So the early work is mentioned here. So there are some important findings in these early work and uh, many uh, in different flows, the general principles seem to agree. One is that a modified lift up mechanism is in operation. So what is lift up? So when you have a uh, just when you're studying the linear stability in the non-modal regime, the typical structures I told you are streamwise independent. So you typically have perturbation vorticity, which is aligned along the wall. And then what this vortex does is that there's low uh, velocity fluid near the wall. It will, um, it will take that uh, away and bring a streak of low speed away from the wall. It will take high speed fluid from away from the wall and bring it closer to the wall. So on the, uh, when you look from the top of this wall, you will see streaks of low and high velocity alternating and that thing will be uh, interchanged at a slightly lower, uh, slightly greater distance from the wall. So, this is the standard uh, lift up mechanism where uh, flu streaks are lifted up from one place to another by streamwise vortices. And then these streaks 
because they are very inflectional. I told you inflection is unstable. So uh, these streaks are going to go through further instabilities uh, due to a variety of reasons and they're going to become three-dimensional. And then the perturbations there are going to non-linearly regenerate the streamwise vortices and this thing can happen. So this is the linear picture. Whereas in the non-linear picture, you see that there is a modified lift-up mechanism in operation. These streaks are not perfectly aligned streamwise any longer. They're going to, uh, you know, they're going to already be three-dimensional and that's the modified lift-up mechanism. And another important finding that everybody found is that when you look for large target times, when you're trying to, uh, you know, maximize the energy at a large target time, you see that linear optimals by definition have to be you know, Fourier modes in X and Z. Whereas nonlinear optimals can be highly local. They can be three-dimensional and highly local. So there's a caution also that is brought in by several people, which is that uh, this whole thing is now a non-convex problem because uh, you're now, you know, doing the stability over the whole Navier-Stokes. And so you will never know in a non-convex thing whether you've reached a local optimum or a global optimum. So, the method I will outline here very briefly. Uh, so uh, the Lagrangian, we, uh, we have to do this. Uh, so the method I mentioned in the previous slide was called direct adjoint looping. And it involves solving the direct equations and the adjoint equations in a loop. And I'll tell you what these are. So you first, your, remember your aim in this whole thing, whole exercise is to optimize something or other. In our case, we want to optimize the kinetic energy growth over a certain time window. So from zero to T, what's the maximum integral kinetic energy uh, growth that we can uh, get? And what is the uh, initial perturbation that we have to give to the laminar flow to make it reach this place? So this is the question that we are asking. And so that is going to go in as a cost functional. So we've defined, uh, um, you know, the highest and possible perturbation energy growth here, but you could define anything that you like. And so you write a Lagrangian, which uh, maximizes, is aimed to maximize the cost functional, but you have to put in various constraints. And these constraints are nothing except the Navier-Stokes has to be obeyed, the scalar equation has to be obeyed, continuity has to be obeyed, and the initial condition has to be respected. And so then you have Vi, Tau, and Q, which are just Lagrange multipliers. It turns out that these Lagrange multipliers are nothing but the adjoint variables. So we'll call the Navier-Stokes and the companion equations, which we integrate from time equal to zero to some capital time T as the direct equations. And you will see that these now contain new terms due to the viscosity stratification. And then by uh, setting va various uh, vari variations of the Lagrangian with respect to the direct variables to zero, we can get equations for the adjoint variables. And these are those equations. So these are now derived for a viscosity stratified flow by us. And we see that uh, there are these new terms coming into the adjoint equations as well. And they involve uh, uh, viscosity perturbations from the direct case and they involve velocities from the direct case. So uh, uh, apart from that, they're uh, linear in the adjoint variables. So these are the uh, uh, adjoint uh, equations for viscosity stratified flow. So how do you solve them and why? So you're solving them to obtain the best energy growth you possibly can. So first you let's first you fix the initial perturbation. And here we don't know what the initial perturbation should be. So we've just put random noise. And so with this random noise, you solve the direct equations from time equal to zero to time equal to capital T. And as I said, store the direct variables as you go along because you're going to need them on your way back. And you can do this in many clever ways. Then, once you've reached the time t, the adjoint equations have given you the final conditions for the adjoint variables. And these adjoint equations have to be now solved in backward time. The reason is that, first of all, they're only well posed in backward time because the diffusivities are negative. Diffusion terms are negative 
uh, as compared to this, as you can see. So these are well posed in backward time. So you solve the adjoint equations in backward time uh, from tau t time equal to t to zero. And now you'll reach time equal to zero where you'll get the adjoint variables. These adjoint variables are going to help you improve your guess, improve your guess for the initial condition, which is going to give you the best growth. So you do this by walking in the direction of how the, the, the way the Lagrangian varies with uh, the initial condition and you walk along the steepest gradient over there and there's many clever ways of doing this. So you keep doing this loop in our case about 150 times for each case. So you're solving Navier-Stokes, adjoint Navier-Stokes, adjoint. It's a mm, long exercise at the end of which you get convergence, uh, which is correct when this thing goes to zero. And so that's what we've done for a viscosity stratified channel. We've got temperature varying linearly initially, and this temperature uh, gives uh, viscosity is a, a function of this temperature. Uh, it's basically exponential in that temperature. And we stick to a Reynolds number of 500. And we uh, stick to a target time of four, but we've checked that our target time is not important because at 500, all perturbations decay at long times. There is no turbulent attracting state to our knowledge. So all perturbations decay and uh, uh, four is a pretty good time to go with. And this, as I told you, is the cost functional, the integral of the disturbance kinetic energy uh, scaled by the init its initial value. So, um, since Reynolds equal to 500 seems to have no uh, attracting turbulence state, we are expecting everything to decay at long time. But we want to understand the nonlinear evolution of uh, perturbations. So first, we will start with finding the optimal bilinear theory. Finding the optimal bilinear theory is far, far easier than doing this direct adjoint looping because you, can, you have, uh, you know, um, singular value decomposition and straightforward ways of doing this. So we, uh, but we employ our nonlinear director joint looping to validate it and to make sure we're getting the same answer. But we start out with a very, very, very small initial distance from the laminar attractor. So this ball of E0 is extremely small. And then we uh, find basically what is the optimal perturbation. So when you do that, uh, this is for the unstratified case and this is for the stratified case. These two are the linear optimals. So you see, first of all, that even in the linear optimal, there's a dramatic change between stratified and unstratified. First of all, there's complete loss of symmetry. And this happens even at uh, small temperature differences, like I said. Everything is quiet at the cold wall. This is the thing that you first see. Remember that I said a cold wall is destabilizing from a Rayleigh Fiotov theorem point of view, from the inflectional point, point of view. Whereas here, like there's no action at the cold wall. So you see that uh, this thing is uh, viscosity stratification can behave very peculiarly. So the mechanism in operation at these small energy levels is called the OR mechanism. And it's very recognizable by the way the, uh, you know, perturbation develops. So initially you have these structures and these structures are uh, fast and slow streamwise flow relative to the fluid. So these are isosurfaces of fast in yellow and slow in blue. So these uh, structures are aligned against the shear initially and then they turn around and then they get aligned with the shear. And until they reach this angle, they're going to give growth of kinetic energy. And this is one of the oldest, you know, uh, non-modal kinetic energy growth mechanisms that was given by Orr uh, well over a century ago, before Bachelor was born. So uh, this is how the flow goes. And remember that we started with a very, very small initial energy. We're going to see what happens if we start with a larger initial energy. So now let's start with a larger initial energy. Larger initial energy, you see that the entire picture has changed with the linear optimal. So you see that instead of the OR mechanism in operation, we're seeing the lift up mechanism in operation. But before we do this, it's important to ask what changed? What changed due to this nonlinearity? So 
uh, and we also asked why was why was linear study so successful for so long in explaining so many things so this we need to answer first of all so there is this reynolds or equation which is just the kinetic energy disturbance kinetic energy balance equation there's a production term and a dissipation term this is a well known equation and it's for the full non linear navier stokes equation so it was pointed out by schmidt and henningsen that this thing is actually independent of the initial amplitude so this is proportional to u square this is proportional to u square and u square so all of them are quadratic in u so suppose i start with a small amplitude flow and i get a particular energy growth scaled by the initial energy i'm going to get the exact same kinetic energy growth even in the non linear case even if i start with a big amplitude so whether or not i start with a big initial amplitude i'm going to get locally or instantaneously the same growth and it turns out that in many flows the fact that energy growth is instantaneously linear as you may call it uh, holds good for quite some time it the non linear and linear behavior follow each other of course if you go very very far away then the initial state itself is different in these two cases so the energy growth here is going to be orders of magnitude different i'd already showed you another example of this thing what happens in viscosity stratified flow it's totally different we are asking is linear good enough at short target times can i have a short target time like in my flow and uh, escape with linear answer is no so the we now write the modified reynolds or equation for viscosity stratified flow and apart from the production term and the dissipation term there's so many extra terms you will see that these things have cubic things in the perturbation the viscosity uh, mu is the perturbation and mu bar is the mean so you will see that there are uh, uh, you know uh, things which absolutely cannot go back to the same growth rate by dividing by any particular number it is not independent of the amplitude not even instantaneously so it's non linear from the start and we're going to see evidence of this so now in this slide we are evolving the linear optimal that means an optimal which we obtained at a very very small initial energy scaled up to this big energy and in temperature equal to 40 so these are uh, uh, stratif this is a stratified case so you see that because there's no action at the cold wall now uh, we then find the non linear optimal at this energy and when you do that you see that the non linear optimal is completely different from the linear optimal even for very short target time so this is very important to realize and while there is uh, a uh, low action at the cold wall it's not that action is um, you know absent at the cold wall and you will see that uh, the cold wall becomes more and more and more active as time goes on which was not at all seen with the linear optimal even when you um, uh, increase the energy to a high uh, level so if you start with the linear optimal you're going to miss what you're going to see in experiment so you have to start with the non linear optimal for the shortest time and not only is it changing uh numerically it is changing qualitatively in that the action is going all to the cold wall as opposed to all near the hot wall so uh this is basically what we expected from our discussion of the reynolds or equation but we see this in action right now now let's compare the stratified to the unstratified we compared the linear to the non linear and now we comparing stratified to the unstratified and when you do a non linear optimal for both of them you see that uh, this uh, the structures are uh, qualitatively the same but you already see a dramatic weakening at the cold wall at zero time in the optimal structure and these are you know streaks which are already three dimensional so you see a kind of modified lift up in operation so you see high speed streak near the wall and lower speed streak so yellow near the wall and blue away from the wall so uh, but as time goes on you see that the uh, action near the hot wall has decreased and the action near the cold wall has increased so like now the cold wall is again playing this big role what's going on 
So uh, you can see uh, also you, one thing we'll notice is that the structures are not very localized and that's because the target times are small. So there's again a big loss in symmetry, but it's a different kind of loss in symmetry between linear and nonlinear. And of course the unstratified is symmetric all through. So in order to understand this, and that's the last thing we will do, uh, we will look at the top views at four different heights in the channel. And this is the cold wall and that is the hot wall. And the temperature difference here is 40 degrees. So at time equal to two, see what's happening on the cold side and the hot side. So the reds are faster fluid than the average and blues are slower fluid than the average. So you see that there are these wavy streaks, three dimensional streaks on both sides, except that the wave numbers seem a bit different. And this seems a bit stronger than the other one, which it will be on the hot side because the shear is greater on the hot side. So you're going to get big structures on the hot side. So initially the hot side is more powerful than the cold side. And um, so you see, uh, basically this is in the central part of the domain and everything I've said is accentuated near the wall. So you see stronger structures near the hot side as compared to the cold side. So uh, I'm sorry, I'm stopping a little bit because I'm not able to see too well. Uh, so then um, you have this uh, um, interesting new thing in these streaks, which is absent in unstratified flow. And the interesting new thing is that there is a viscosity perturbation. You see that the perturbation, high viscosity, the fast fluid on the cold side. On the hot side, the high viscosity is neatly aligned with the, the high speed is neatly aligned with the high viscosity. So here it is high speed, high viscosity. Here it is high speed, low viscosity. Sorry, I got that mixed up. High speed and low viscosity are neatly aligned. And because of this, and because of the way the inflection points are going, we're going to see that in the last slide. Uh, you see uh, that the hot, hot wall, uh, lots of instability is taking place and the flow is completely mixed to the point where you can't identify which fluid is which. On the other hand, near the cold wall, everything persists and everything is accentuated. And so, the sh the, and one thing to note is that the shear is low on the cold side compared to the hot side. And this is unstratified, which is in the middle. So basically what's happening is first there's stronger lift up near the hot wall, stronger inflection near the hot wall. And because there's stronger inflection, the flow gets perturbed more easily and it goes into a mixed thing. And uh, whereas near the cold wall, uh, the inflection is weak at first, but becomes stronger because of this thing, because of the way the fast fluid is aligned with the high uh, viscosity. So, sorry, the cold uh, slow, the fast fluid, so it's like this. When you have a pressure gradient uh, across the channel, let's assume, and this is the top view, remember, let's assume that the pressure gradient is similar. So imagine what's going to happen. If you have fast fluid going at low viscosity, that's going to be, um, you know, okay by the pressure gradient being the same as compared to slow fluid with higher viscosity as opposed to the other way around. So if you have fast fluid with high viscosity, then uh, pressure, the pressure gradient being the same across this is going to disturb that. And that is what is happening at the hot wall, whereas uh, at the cold wall, the pressure gradient is conserving these differences. So uh, this is basically what I wanted to say. I started saying that, uh, you know, we're going to give a resounding no to this uh, supposition and I hope I've done that. And here are my uh, um, summary uh, uh, statements. Thank you for your attention. Rama, thank you very much indeed for uh, a, a lovely talk and, and very interesting. We think of viscosity being uh, a dissipative influence and a calming influence. So it's always intriguing to see situations in which uh, viscosity is the, uh, the, the, the bad guy um, actually causing uh, uh, instability. So, so there are some questions that have come through. Um, so the, the first one relates to experiments um, uh, when you, you've presented very nice theoretical uh, arguments. 
But uh, are there ways that you can change the viscosity without changing the density? Because I think that was a sort of premise in your... Yeah, uh, yeah, there are ways in which you can do that. You might have to put some additives in one of the fluids in order to density match, but uh, like water glycerol mixtures, you can very easily uh, change, you can very easily attain this thing. And there's many ways to do this. Sure. And the other thing is in temperature variation, you could work with a horizontal channel, in which case you wouldn't have to worry about gravity. And in your, so coming back to the, th the theoretical side of things, um, in your adjoint calculations, the adjoint loop calculations, um, do your initial conditions for those uh, only have perturbations in velocity and not in temperature? And, yeah, and so in, in our particular case, we set the initial temperature perturbations to zero. This is a very, very good question. Um, because there is uh, no participation, direct participation of the temperature in the energy. So we could, in principle, put another perturbation and we would actually get slightly different answers at least the answers would be different quantitatively so there is no good ideal uh, you know temperature condition so we, we might want to go through the whole gamut to see which increases the uh, you know kinetic energy the most however if you have a gravity driven case and this is the case we're studying right now so in this channel we've also put a density difference we've recognized that temperature produces a density difference. And when you study that, there is uh, the, the correct way to look at it is like try to maximize for a sum of kinetic and potential energy, because these things can keep getting transferred between each other. And in that case, there is a very natural, you know, initial condition to be satisfied and the initial temperature will come into the optimization procedure. Sure. And then, so it's just essentially that the temperature isn't coming into your cost functional, your, your energy. Exactly. And what are the physical constraints for your Lagrange multiplier optimization problem? So basically, we have the geometry we are talking about and the Navier-Stokes and continuity and uh, the temperature and all those equations have to be satisfied within the uh, geometry. And these equations themselves are our constraints. Yeah, right. so these uh, these equations and the boundary conditions, they all must satisfy. All of them are constraints. So in particular, the boundary conditions at the wall and at the periodic thing are also constraints, which are included in this invisibly. And by the optimization procedure, we also derive what should be the boundary conditions for the adjoint variables. And in this case, they turn out to be identical to that of the direct variables. So th this is an extension, really, because um, you talked about these two layer systems of different viscosities, but I guess they, these were miscible fluids and so, so had some continuous viscosity stratification between those two. So, um, yeah, so how, what, how that, that, you could have either that, you could have two yeah. fluids with a stratification like that, or you could have a temperature perturbation, which is, you yeah. know, uniform across. So the whole layer is static. So the, the Sorry, question I'm... really was what, what would happen if you had sharp transitions in viscosity across interfaces with a non-zero surface tension? Okay, so, uh, you know, we talked about this poor miscibility instability. As you keep on reducing the diffusivity and take the diffusivity to zero, then, and you, as you keep on thinning the layer, then the answer goes uh, very close to the sharp interface answer. And you can see that because there's action at the interface. And here you have a critical layer, which is just basically getting focused onto the interface. So in an interface is a brilliant example of an overlap instability, where you have the viscosity jump overlapping with the critical layer, exactly. So at poor miscibility, one go, this goes into that. And uh, surface tension adds a new dimension. Typically, surface tension stabilizes. There's interesting cases where it destabilizes, but I won't go into that. Thank you very much, Rama, uh, for a very enlightening talk. There's lots of uh, very positive comments in the chat, uh, which I won't, I won't read out, but we'll keep a record of those. Um, I meant to do this at the end of the last talk, but we'll do it for both speakers now. I think in Zoom, there are various uh, reactions, and I invite you to, to give some virtual applause to, to both uh, uh, speakers if, if we can do that.
And um, if I may take a minute. Yes, Rama, uh, my, please do. Uh, my co-author Arjun is pointing out that uh, there's one more physical constraint I missed, which is the initial ball of kinetic energy that we are specifying. And we always have to make sure that that kinetic, we, uh, every uh, guess after every loop obeys that uh, amplitude of that kinetic energy. Sorry about that. Not at all. No, thank you very much.